looking at the subject of irresistible grace, and I'm going to move quickly through some of these charts because we started in the first hour, and I want to be able to get through the material that we have to have. If you weren't here for the nine o'clock hour, I would encourage you to go back and to listen to uh, that lesson because I kind of set the stage for what we're looking at. We talked about the background of, of irresistible grace. It's part of uh, the five points of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. We've looked at the first three. We're looking at the fourth aspect of uh, Calvinism this morning. And we pointed out the fact that irresistible grace is essentially that uh, Calvin, Augustine, and then Calvin tells us that because man is totally depraved, inherited from Adam, thus totally unable to do anything good, even believe, understand God's Word, or believe it, that God has to, by His grace, send a direct power of the Holy Spirit to the heart, to the soul of an unbeliever to miraculously overcome that depravity and to give him a heart of belief, to give that person faith. Not that that person chooses to believe, but the Holy Spirit gives them faith and then the ability to understand. So this is necessitated by the fact that there is a belief that God has predestined all things, that He has arbitrarily chosen some to be saved and chosen some to be lost, and so those who are saved, God is going to send this measure of grace, a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, to give them faith and an understanding eye, and only to those who He has chosen. What we noticed is that that means that the gospel plays no part in this. The gospel has nothing to do with our salvation if Calvinism is correct. Because we are told that a person whether they are elect or not elect cannot be drawn by the gospel to believe or drawn to Jesus Christ. We looked at the Westminster Confession of Faith and it was extensive, so I, I don't have time to read all the way through it again, but I invite you to go back and to listen to that. We see that the explanation is that uh, this act of submission uh, is impossible for a person totally depraved, so the Holy Spirit has to come and to impart this change in this elect sinner and to go against their sinful nature to give them a new nature, but it is only for the elect. And it is irresistible because clearly if God has predestined that someone's going to be saved, He's going to make sure that they are saved. And it is essentially forced on the person that God has chosen. We saw this morning that this contradicts the scriptural principle of free will. We already studied that when we talked about predestination and God's sovereignty. We know that man does have free will. This is in contradiction of that. It's unbiblical. We also saw that it mistakenly portrays how people are called to God uh, called by God to faith and salvation. And we saw in Titus chapter 2 and in verse 11 that the Bible clearly says that the grace of God has appeared to all men, and if God's grace is irresistible, then all would be saved. Well, the Calvinist doesn't want to believe that, so I'm not sure what he wants to do with that passage. But the grace of God has appeared to all men. And then it tells us immediately after in verse 12, the grace of God has appeared to all men teaching us. God's grace is by or through, in part, the gospel revelation of God, giving us the knowledge, the conviction, the knowledge, the hope, the assurance, the promise, and the path of salvation. That is by God's grace. So, yes, this has appeared to all men. So what we started out doing after that is we just simply asked this question, how does the Bible say that people are made believers? And we started by looking in Acts chapter 11, where Peter went to Cornelius, and before Peter got there, an angel instructed Cornelius to send for Peter and told him that when Peter would come, he would tell Cornelius words by which he and all his household would be saved. The ESV says that he would declare a message. That's still words. That's still preaching. The message he declared was the gospel. We have the account of it. He told him about Jesus Christ and about uh, uh, the one who works righteousness is accepted by God. That's how they received faith 
and how they were saved was by words. And then we went to Matthew 13. So I invite you to turn over there. We stopped there because we didn't have time to go through that parable. And there's going to be some points that we need to make as we go through it. So turn to Matthew chapter 13. As we look in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives the parable of the sower in verse 11 through verse, uh, or excuse me, I'm sorry, in verse 3 through verse 9. His disciples ask him for some explanation. And he explains the parable in verse 18 through verse 23. It is by the mercy of God that the Lord explained this parable and that we have the ability to take what he says about it. And so he says, Some seed fell by the wayside, some fell on stony places, some fell among thorns, and other seed fell among good ground. The first thing that I want us to determine is what is the seed in this parable? What does the seed stand for? What does it represent? This is not difficult. The Lord explains, not in difficult terms, but explicitly He says the seed is the Word of God. He's giving us a parable about the kingdom of heaven, and He says the seed, the seed is the genesis of life. Now that seed needs the right elements. It needs the right environment. Taylor spoke about that. Uh, this past week, and I'm not going to say again that I'm going to take it to the next level because I, I didn't do that last week. I won't do that this week. But we are going to look at another stage of it. So, that, so it has to have the right environment, but the seed is the genesis of life. And that seed is the Word of God. All the products of the kingdom spring from the seed of the kingdom under the divine blessing of God. That's what he's telling us. And I want to tell you that no matter how good your ground is, how well you prepare it, how honest you labor, if, uh, if you're going to raise wheat or corn without seed, you're going to fail miserably. No matter how good the ground is, you must have the seed that is necessary. It is indispensable, and in the same way, in the kingdom of Christ, we must have the seed of the kingdom, or we cannot have the products of the kingdom. And the first, most basic product of the kingdom is faith. And that is exactly where faith comes from. You cannot have faith without the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God. And men can theorize about faith and the faith of Christ without hearing the gospel, but they won't have it. They can theorize about faith without hearing the gospel, but they won't have faith without hearing the gospel. That's just the Bible on the issue. We might as well talk about corn or wheat or some other product of the ground without seed as to talk about faith without the Word of God. And the next thing is to look at the, the wayside ground. In the parable, he speaks about the one who receives the word uh, that is represented by the wayside ground. What does that represent? Well, it represents an idle, indifferent, careless hearer. A person who does not take in the word of God to consider it, to meditate on it, to, be, to allow it to have any impact on their heart. And when they do this, the Lord says... Then the wicked one comes and snatches away the word of God that was sown in their heart. Mark says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 15, When they hear, Satan comes immediately. We were talking about immediately and immediately. Immediately is without intervention. It, and thus it happens quickly. It says that when these people hear the gospel... Satan comes immediately. You might ask, well, what roused him? What called him up? What's his mission? What's the urgency? Well, a man has heard the gospel, that gospel that produces faith. And Satan and his evil, malignant, premeditated design is to defeat the Word of God and thus defeat the divine means by which men believe and are saved. It's that simple, is it not? I know you've read this parable time and again. What is the urgency of Satan here? It is because someone has heard the gospel that is the genesis of faith which brings salvation. Why does he snatch the word out of his heart? Luke 8, chapter, verse, uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 12 answers it. Jesus said, lest he should believe and be saved. Simple, isn't it? There is no direct operation of the Holy Spirit being mentioned. There is no inner light. There is no irresistible grace. It is the hearing of the Word of God, believing and being saved. Luke 8 and verse 12. And so this shows us that the Word of God is the seed. 
and that when it's sown in the heart that men should believe it and be saved. And that the devil understands this work, and when the seed is sown in a man's heart, he comes and snatches it away out of his heart lest he believe and be saved. The devil understands something about how faith comes that a Calvinist doesn't. And that's the reason that many don't believe. What does the sony ground stand for or represent in this parable? Well, notice it with me. It represents a hearer who doesn't appear as hard as the wayside ground that was just, uh, just described. He receives the word. He takes it with joy. But when it speaks about the stony ground, you might think, why would somebody sow seed on stones? Well, the stony ground was not ground where stones were prevalent. It's the stone was just under the surface. There was a thin layer of topsoil over the stone, but there was no depth of earth. That's what's being described here. And so he receives the word with joy, it says, and the, and the, and the plant, uh, uh, the faith comes forth as a result of that. And Satan can't steal it, so he uses the next method, persecution or suffering. The problem that exists with this man, according to Mark 4 and 5, Matthew 13 and 5, is that it didn't have much earth, no depth of earth. At first, it doesn't appear to be a problem. He believes quickly, but as he began to build, as Jesus said in John 14, 28, he did not have enough to finish it. He didn't have enough earth. He didn't have enough commitment of heart. The ground represents the heart Matthew, uh, here in verse 19 of Matthew 13. This man had no depth of earth, or in other words, he had a shallow heart. And heart in the sense of where the Bible tells us not to lose heart. It's talking about our determination. It's talking about our commitment. And that's what this man lacked. A plant is only as strong as its root system. And the Word tries to root itself in and look for moisture, according to Luke 8 and 6. But it hits bedrock. You know what? The reality is this man's heart is just as hard as the first man's. It just looks better. Because there's a thin layer of soil covering it up. The bottom line is it's hard. And there is no potential there unless that ground is properly prepared. And so he yields the word. It is scorched by the, he, it, it, the ground is scorched by the sun. He yields the word. He gives it up. And that's the end of the road for him. He gave up the word. He gave up his faith. He gave up his salvation. You don't need to follow him and expect to find some immediate power being made to him uh, uh, to cause him to be a believer or to make him a Christian and to save him after he had been offended by the word, made to stumble by it, and turned his ear away from it. There is no power that the Lord brings to bear on men who turn their ear away from the gospel. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9, He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. That's who this man is. There is no immediate power, and there is no uh, arbitrary election or diselection that is going to cause this man to be saved apart from hearing the gospel. But what about the thorny ground? The thorny ground represents a man whose heart is not hard, not on top, not under the surface. So how does Satan work on him? This, this man doesn't give up the seed how does Satan work on him? This man takes the word in and he believes it. So Satan can't steal it. It doesn't stay on top of the ground. And he has depth of ground. So Satan can't scorch it out of him. It's able to find some moisture there. So what does Satan do? He chokes it. And he represents it as being filled with weeds and thorns and thistles. What he does is he chokes it with the cares of this world and the desire for riches and other things. So the point is, if Satan can't take the word and make the faith non-existent like he did with the stony ground, he'll just choke it to an existent but lifeless faith. You know, James tells us in James 2.17 about a faith that's lifeless. It's a dead faith because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't bear any fruit, and that's what happens here. He chokes it so that it doesn't bear any fruit. This man didn't clear everything out of his heart. 
He had a divided heart. That's what happened to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, in verses 16 through 22. He had many possessions. He wasn't willing to be separated from those things. The bottom line is that there's a direct relation. Choke the word, choke the faith. Choke the faith and lose your salvation. The faith is directly connected. What about the good ground? What does that represent? Well, it represents a man who receives the Word of God on a good and honest heart. He understands it, and Luke says he brings forth much fruit. The good and honest heart is the soil for the good seed, the Word of God. And that is God's method. That is His intent for producing fruit in the kingdom Faith being the very first of those. God's Word is sown in honest hearts. And you know what's interesting? He does not produce these good fruits of the kingdom without the good seed of the kingdom. Now, I shouldn't have to even state that. It is so obvious. And I want you to notice something else as we go through this particular parable. The Lord doesn't talk about producing these good fruits by sowing the seed in a totally depraved heart, does he? But in a good and honest heart. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, and a good and honest heart is the soil by God's appointment to bring forth this fruit. And all this shows that there's no room for this speculation that some immediate power or influence has to be given. The Son of God Himself causes the seed to be sown, the good seed of the kingdom, the word of God, this seed is received into good and honest hearts that understand it and bring forth much fruit. And that corresponds to what Jesus said earlier in verses 13 through 15, where he speaks about the fact that uh, he said, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Well, why, why don't they understand? He says, because they've closed their, because their, their hearts are dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. They've done this themselves. It was not something in their creation that they had inherited from Adam or any decree of God, but it was an act of their own. They closed their eyes. And they themselves are blamed for this failure. The parable of the sower is the ABCs. I mean, it's, it's the phonics of faith, of how people are going to come to be believers and bear fruit in the kingdom. And it all starts with the Word of God. No immediate, direct operation of God on the souls of totally depraved people. Nowhere in that. So let's look in John 17. We'll go a little bit quicker with some of the rest of these verses. John 17, I want you to notice there in verse 20. In John chapter 17 and in verse 20 and in verse 21. Notice, read with me there. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now I want you to notice something that is clearly stated here. I want to ask a question. Who does the Lord pray for here? You might say, for those who believe. And that's right. That's true. But He's more explicit than that. You see it? He said he's praying for those who believe in him through their word. The words of the apostles. The word that Jesus sent by means of the Holy Spirit to reveal it to the apostles so that they would preach it and write it down so that we can believe it. Jesus was praying for those who would believe in him through their word. I want to tell you, if there are those whose faith did not come through the word, the word of the apostles, they're not included in this prayer. That's just the reality of it. If there are those that believe by some immediate direct operation of the Holy Spirit that didn't come through the preaching of the gospel, Jesus did not pray for them. He didn't pray for their unity. He didn't pray for them to be one in 
uh, uh, Him and in the Father. The Lord did not pray for them, but for those who would believe on Him through the Word of God. This one passage ought to settle it for us, but you know we won't stop there. John chapter 20 now. Let's go just a few chapters ahead. John chapter 20. And I want to look in verse 30 and in verse 31. John chapter 20, in verse 30 and in verse 31. John writes, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Three very important questions answered. What are these things written for? That you might believe. The Apostle shows the Lord's plan for making believers. What has been done in order to make faith accessible to them. These things, these words are written that you might believe. Secondly, what must we believe? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The words that are written that the Holy Spirit calls the Gospel that we have in the book of God, the Word of God, the New Testament, these words reveal that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what is the purpose in believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? You see it? That we might have life through His name. That's the great purpose of our faith, to give us the privilege of life through His name. How beautiful the benevolence and the grace of God. We've just sang this. How beautiful the benevolence and the grace of God stands out in all of this. Man cannot believe without the information or the truth to believe. The Lord gives the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And this truth cannot be believed by man unless it is revealed to him with the testimony required to make it credible. Eyewitness testimony and testimony that is followed up with miracles that confirm that these men are speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God did that too. That's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16. That He was working with the disciples or through them and through the accompanying signs and wonders and miracles. God had these things written so that they would be revealed, that we might read them, understand them, believe them, and that by believing we might have life through His name. Pretty simple, isn't it? You see, this is fundamental stuff. But this is what is so wrong about Calvinism that has influenced practically every denomination among us. Let's look in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, I want you to notice there in verse 7. In Acts chapter 15, you'll remember that here in Acts chapter 15, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul and Silas went down to Jerusalem to confer with the other apostles and with the elders of the church there regarding the Judaizing teachers that were teaching that the Gentiles had to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so in their conference, as they conferred, Peter spoke about what had been done in, uh, um, in the household of Cornelius. And he stands up in verse 7, and it says, When there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Boy, they, these are just too easy, aren't they? How, were, how would the Gentiles have faith? Peter said, by my mouth, they would hear the word of the gospel. Not just the word, but the word of the gospel. And as a result of that, they would believe. This is as clear as language can express anything. So if it was the choice of God that the Gentiles by the mouth of Peter would hear the word of the gospel and believe, then that means that it was not his choice that they should believe without a word. That they should believe by means of an immediate, direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon their heart. 
Let's look at another one that you're very familiar with. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, said, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? As clear as it can be. If he had said faith comes by feeling, by an immediate influence by the Spirit, or by anything else besides hearing the Word of God, it would have been just as easy to say. And it would have been just as easy to preach. But he settles the question by saying that faith comes by hearing. And he doesn't stop at that. But I want you to notice that he plainly states what we must hear, that it must be the Word of God. He even reasons the matter out. Going back to verse 14. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Now listen to this. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? You say, well, he's talking about hearing that wee small voice in the night from the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what he's saying. He said, how shall they hear without a preacher? He's not talking about a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? He's talking about the same method and measure of gospel preaching that we understand today. If the Lord had not called and sent the apostles to preach the gospel We never could have heard it. And if we never heard it, we could not believe it. And if we never believed it, we could never have called on the name of the Lord. That's what the Scripture says. This, then, is a settlement of the question. But somebody might point out, well, Brett, you know, in the beginning of your sermon in the first hour, you granted that God makes men believers. I mean, from the start, you said God makes men believers. He does. But I pointed out that he does it by means. And that's exactly the point of what we're investigating here this morning. Does he make believers by a direct influence or power of himself exerted to the heart of the sinner? Or does he make believers through a mediation or through means of the gospel? That's been the question all along. And somebody says, well, didn't you agree also that he makes believers by the Holy Spirit? I certainly did. And the Bible teaches that. That's without reservation. But is it not possible? And is it not in harmony with the Scriptures that He makes believers through or by means of the Gospel revealed by the Holy Spirit and thus by the Holy Spirit? When something is done, the the Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. It's a tool in His hand, if you will. And so if something is done by the sword of the Spirit, as the Spirit wields it, it is being done by the Spirit. The illustration that that has often been used, if if I said, well, I I cut down that tree over there that's on the ground, and then later I say, and there's the saw that cut it down, I didn't lie to anyone. I cut the tree down with the saw. You understand that. So when we read about something done by the Holy Spirit, And then another time, the same thing done by the Word of God, it's not a contradiction. It is done by the Holy Spirit by means of the Word of God. And that should be no difficulty for us. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 12, I want you to see why this concept should not be difficult for us at all. 1 Peter chapter 1, over toward the end of your New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want to look in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 12. And listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit here. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version. He says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, he's talking about the prophets, okay? It was revealed to them not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those, listen, who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. The gospel was preached by what? By the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, it was through the inspired apostles, but it was by the Holy Spirit. That's how it was accomplished. It was not that the apostles spoke, but the Spirit spoke in them. And the person who believed the words which the Holy Spirit spoke through those men was certainly made a believer by the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, we're made believers by the Holy Spirit through the Word that He has revealed. The Holy Spirit operates on men by words. Let's look at a few verses to point this out. 1 Corinthians 2. You get really good at turning these verses. 1 Corinthians 2 and in verse 13. He says, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, "...which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches." You see that? These words are words that the Holy Spirit teaches. So when a person believes these words, who are they taught by? The Holy Spirit. They're made a believer by means of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 10. Matthew 10 and verse 20. In Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 20, Jesus was sending His disciples out on a limited commission to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. And He says in Matthew 10 and in verse 20, For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. The Spirit of God speaks in the apostles, and those who hear His words and believe them are made believers by the Spirit. You know, the problem is that many people are praising the Spirit for what they ascribe to Him as a work done without words, and at the same time they're refusing to give heed to the words spoken by the Spirit. You ever thought about that? They sound so wonderful and so sweet, praising the Holy Spirit for saving people without words, and yet they're rejecting the very words of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 8 and verse 29. In Acts chapter 8 and in verse 29, remember Philip was going to go and preach the gospel to the Ethiopian? And it says in Acts 8 and 29, then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. How did the Spirit operate on Philip? That, yeah, I mean, that was pretty direct, right? Was it a feeling? Was it just a, was just a direct operation on his heart? Some kind of fit? No, he spoke to him. He gave him words that he could understand. He said to Philip, overtake this chariot. He uttered words that were remembered and embodied in Luke's narrative. It wasn't anything mysterious. Acts chapter 10. Just go a couple of chapters ahead. Acts chapter 10, in verse 19, this is going to be when he is uh, uh, in the whole conversion of Cornelius. In Acts 10, in verses 19 through 20, when Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That wasn't a mysterious feeling. That wasn't a better felt than told experience. The Holy Spirit said directly, the Holy Spirit operates on men and women through words, specifically the words of the gospel. 1 Timothy 4. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 1. Paul is giving Timothy some warnings. 1 Timothy 4 and in verse 1. And he says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. How is the Spirit said to operate here? The Spirit speaks. Not just speaks, but He expressly speaks. He speaks expressly. That word expressly means explicitly. He was clear about what He said. He didn't just give Him a vague notion or an idea. Hebrews 3 and verses 7 through 9. Hebrews 3, 7 through 9. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Notice that. That's a quote. That is a quote from Psalm 95. And when the New Testament writer recorded it, he said, The Holy Spirit says. He didn't say David said. He didn't say the psalmist said. He said the Holy Spirit said. And then he quoted an Old Testament Scripture. My friend, when you're reading the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And when you uh, uh, acquire faith as a result of hearing the Word of God, it is by the Holy Spirit. And we could go on and on. We've already looked at probably 15 passages in which it is said that the Holy Spirit operates through and by words. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Gospel is the power of God to salvation. We started out with that this morning, but I want to come back to it now. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. 
Are you looking at it? Romans 1.16 To everyone who believes. Not to some, but everyone who believes. If there's a believer that has ever lived, that believer was made a believer by the power of God. Would you not agree? And that power of God is the gospel, the Word of God, not a direct, immediate operation of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we clearly see how believers are made. There's so much more that could be said about this, and and it will warrant some other studies well into the future, but we are going to be coming back to look at some aspects of what we call neo-Calvinism simply because there is kind of a, an, an offshoot or a new form of Calvinism, not classic Calvinism, but it has, it, it has as its basis many of the Calvinistic concepts. We're going to be looking at those when we finish the series. And I want you to remember this about irresistible grace. All of those concepts about the direct working and revelation of the Holy Spirit to people, this is where it finds its birth. All those ideas. And furthermore, the ideas in neo-Calvinism about what God's grace does, we'll be talking a lot about that. All all of these ideas of neo-Calvinists about what God's grace does, mark it down. It begins with the belief about man's inability. They will not say they believe in total inability, but they believe in an inability that is unscriptural. Therefore, they, like the Calvinists, go to grace to find God forgiving sins that haven't been repented of and doing other things that the Scripture does not speak about. So it's important that we understand the classic foundation of Calvinism before we go on to what we're really dealing with actually within the church today by brethren, by preachers, who have uh, uh, read a few too many Calvinistic commentaries and have bought into these concepts. But we're almost done with this. We've got one more element to look at, and that is the perseverance of the saints, or as many people call it, once saved, always saved. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. We've gone just a little bit past the hour, but you've been so good to follow along, look at these scriptures, And if you have any questions, disagreement, you want to study this further, I'd be happy to do that with you. You've given me your time, I'll give you mine. But if you're here this morning and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, I want to tell you where it begins. It begins with the hearing of the gospel, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that He died as a sacrifice for your sins and for mine. And that He has provided salvation, and that salvation is in Him. But the way that we are to get into Him is through our faith, our confession, and our, uh, a confession of our allegiance to Him, our faith in Him, our repentance, turning away from our past sins, and being baptized into that fellowship with Him. That's how we enter into Christ. That's where we're chosen. That's where we're saved. And you can do that this morning. All things.